Hi everybody and welcome to the latest video in the series supporting AQA the making of modern Britain that's unit 2a and in today's video we're going to look at the Conservative Party during the years that Tony Blair was Prime Minister uh, and that's 1997 through to 2000. So first of all the aftermath of the 1997 election as you know, of course, the 97 election was a huge landslide victory uh, for Tony Blair and for his new Labour Party uh, after 18 years of Conservative government. And it was no surprise to anyone when the morning after that enormous landslide, 179 seats, John Major resigned as leader of the Conservative Party. And every election defeat leads to soul searching and big questions within a political party, but a landslide, that's particularly the case. And so pretty much straight away, there were some very uh, significant and pretty heated discussions about the future of the Conservative Party and the direction that it ought to go in. And there were some people in the Conservative Party who simply felt, look, you know, we, we need to bide our time. We've had 18 years in power. Uh, Labour has actually taken on board quite a lot of that tribe. Tony Blair um, had very consciously done that, positioned Labour right in the centre. It was clear he wasn't going to reverse, for example, a lot of privatisation or the trade union reforms. And these people in the party were saying, ultimately, Labour will do some of the stuff we've done. It'll do it less well. The voters will soon realise we are the natural party of government and we'll be back in five years time. You know, Blair is all spin and no substance. But then there were other people in the Conservative Party who said, actually, no, this victory for Labour was so massive. This defeat for us was so huge that this is a turning point. And for those Conservatives, it was similar to some Labour people in 1983. They said, we are going to have to change if we ever want to become a party of government again. If we ever want the voters to trust us again, if we ever want to be electable, we are going to have to change. Now. As I said, these discussions were difficult ones, they were heated ones, and it's no surprise there were still really deep-rooted divisions over the issue of Europe. Those have been prominent in the later years of Thatcher and throughout Major's time, but there were still divisions, even seven years on, over Thatcher's departure that were die-hard. Thatcherites who felt she'd been betrayed, and other people who felt that her departure had been long overdue. So the first priority for the party, of course, was electing a new leader. And it was an interesting one, the 97 contest, because two of the, the big beasts, the main candidates who could have succeeded Major, uh, didn't stand. Uh, one of them was Michael Heseltine. Uh, he was still an MP, but he was suffering uh, with heart problems. Michael Portillo, who was a really popular figure on the right of the party, had very famously lost his seat in the 97 landslide. It had been a very safe Conservative seat. Nobody ever expected Paul Thillow to lose. And it was one of those really memorable moments of election night. But of course, Paul Tillow, not an MP, could not become leader. So that left several other people. There was Ken Clark. So he'd been Home Secretary and late Chancellor under John Major. And he was quite a popular public figure. Um, some people recognised that the economy had actually boomed uh, in the later years of the major government. wasn't enough to win them an election, but Clark was seen as, a, as someone who'd helped that to happen. Um, he was seen as a, as a, a quite a fun sort of character. Um, you know, he smoked cigars, he drank whiskey, he liked jazz, uh, he seemed affable. Um, so he was possibly the leader who would have been more popular with the public than any of his rivals. However, among the Conservative MPs who remained, and there were only 165 of them, Clark was not very popular. Partly because most of them were Eurosceptic, he was passionately pro-European. Um, Clark, unlike most of that cabinet, uh, had been much more openly critical of her in her final months particularly in her final days in office. And so he was verging on a hate figure among some of the more fact-right MPs. So while Clark would have pro 
probably stood the best chance of winning the next election compared to his rivals in this uh, contest. Ultimately, he was not going to become leader. And at this point, the decision was entirely in the hands of the Conservative MPs. Um, and a bandwagon really emerged, the anyone but Penn approach, the anyone but Clark approach. Um, and right wingers, Eurosceptics, realised they had to uh, come together, coalesce around one right wing candidate. As we said, it couldn't be Portillo. And that left John Edward, who challenged May in 95. Uh, Michael Howard, who'd been Home Secretary, uh, Peter Lilly, another outspoken right-wing cabinet member, but ultimately triumphing over all of those and over Clark as well was William Haig. And it was William Haig, a right-winger, only 36 years old, very young by politician standards, William Haig, who became Conservative leader. Not favourite at the beginning of the race, but by the end it was pretty clear he was going to. And so look about William Haig, as we said, he's young, he's 36, he's seen as a fresh face. Um, he had been in Major's cabinet, but only for a couple of years. He was Welsh secretary uh, after Redwood resigned in 95. Um, but the interesting thing about Haig is he has the support of a very prominent figure from the past, and that prominent figure is Margaret Thatcher. And she saw him, to use her phrase, as one of us, a great thatch right believer, someone who had absolutely bought in to new right economics. From the beginning though, Haig struggled. It's not unusual that a new government has a bit of a honeymoon period, clearly it's popular enough to have won the election, and the voters generally give it a bit of a chance. Uh, the Blair honeymoon was longer the most, and well into 1998, the Blair government is still really very popular. And William Hay just isn't able to make an impact against the force of Blair, the charisma, the spin machine, the popularity of the policies. Now, Haig does manage to unite the Conservative Party to some extent on that very divided issue of Europe. What William Haig said, and the big European issue at the time was not so much Brexit, it was whether the UK should join a single currency, that was the euro that was in the process of being established. Um, and William Haig promised that if he were to be Prime Minister, the UK would not join the euro in the foreseeable future. And that phrase was enough to unite the party. It wasn't enough to make them popular with the voters. And what's interesting here is that these debates pick up speed, the debates about the future of the party. And what's really interesting is that it's actually one or two of the hardcore Thatcherites, uh, like Peter Lilly, who had been a real supporter of Thatcher, a really right wing member of Major's cabinet, who start to ask the difficult questions. And Peter Lilly, great fan of privatisation, acknowledges that actually the public are not really into the idea of lots more privatisation. He recognises that anything that looks like schools or the NHS being privatised is going to be really unpopular. Michael Porter, who briefly, of course, is outside of Parliament, but another person who'd been a died in the wall factor, right? Uh, he as well begins to ask some awkward questions. And he says, look, whether we like it or not, the voters see us as stuck in the past. And intolerant and bigoted as, as not really caring about the poor and vulnerable and just completely obsessed with Europe. And at the time, Europe was an issue that most people really didn't have strong feelings about at all. And it's really interesting that it's not people like Clark necessarily asking the big questions about the future of the party. It's Thatcherites like Lillian Portillo who start to recognise that radical Thatcherism is not going to win them. And of real life. Having said that, there are other right wingers who see Lily and Patillo as Judas style figures. They see this as betrayal. And Haig is very quick in public to say that is a good thing, that prism is right, and really just to tone things down a little bit. However, Michael Portillo, although he has gone away briefly, is not going away for long. Uh, in 1999, there's a by-election in London, in Kensington and Chelsea. Portillo is parachuted in, he wins that by-election, and he's 
Commons, and Hayne, who knows Portillo, too popular and powerful to be ignored, very quickly appoints him as a Chancellor. So Portillo, very quickly back. And the big questions that Portillo and his supporters are asking are definitely not going to go away. And so let's move on to the 2001 election. Now, there was very little surprise when it came to the 2001 election result. It was a second landslide in a row, uh, only 167, uh, the previous one had been 179. To win a second landslide with that sort of majority was a huge achievement. Blair. Um, it was predictable. A lot of people found the electoral campaign pretty dull. Everybody knew Labour was going to win another landslide. The turnout was the lowest in modern British general election history at around 59%. There was a lot of apathy there, but it was pretty inevitable. Uh, the Conservatives had been behind in the polls pretty much for the whole of those four years. And the Conservatives really were not anywhere close. Uh, they were still seen as divided. People's memories of the John Major years, of the Sleaze, of Black Wednesday, of the scandals, those memories were still pretty strong. Like Portillo uh, was arguing, there were people who said, look, we think the Conservatives are nasty. They, they don't care. Uh, they don't care if we're unemployed or poor. Um, they're not going to be very nice to us if we are from an ethnic minority or the LGBT community. But also there were other factors. Um, Blair himself and his government remained unusually popular for a government four years in. It's also the case of the first past the post system, um, which very much discriminates against third parties, uh, tends to discriminate against the party coming second, where that party has had a bad election. The Conservatives didn't do brilliantly in terms of percentage of the vote, but they did worse than that in terms of the percentage of seats won. And all of those factors together combine to make this another really damaging defeat. And a final factor, or another factor, is William Hague himself. <clears throat> now, if you get a chance, it's well worth um, having a look online at William Hague's first moment of fame. It was when he was a 16-year-old from Rotherham, um, and he tended to put the Conservative Party conference making um, a barnstorming speech in favour of uh, that uh, and Thatcherism. Now, obviously, you know, you're listening to this panel, and you, you probably don't see anything strange about 16-year-olds being really into politics, and nor should you. However, for a lot of people, William Hague was a bit odd. He was a bit of a politics obsessive. He was a bit of a politics geek. Um, and in a sense, the more he does as leader, try and seem normal, baseball cap and goes to a theme park and um, claims that he used to drink 14 pints a day as a teenager when he was working for his dad. And um, the more he tries to seem normal, the more weird it comes across. And so it backfires. And Haig really can't win. He's either geeky and weird or he's trying too hard to seem normal. Either way, <clears throat> he's no match for Tony Blair. And the Blair magic and the Blair charisma is still wrong at this point. Another thing to know really about the very early noughties and the late nineties is that a lot of people were probably somewhere in the political centre. Um, they weren't massively economically left-wing, they were relatively socially liberal. Anything very right really didn't chime with a lot of what voters wanted. Um, so when the Conservatives were talking about a very tough line on immigrants, when they were banging on quite a bit about saving the pound and not joining the Euros, for a lot of voters who were more concerned about spending on the NHS and on schools, uh, it didn't really fit with what they wanted. And um, this sort of centrist Blairism was still where a lot of people were. And of course, Thatcher, not the popular figure that she'd been among some sections of the election in the 80s. Um, Thatcher, popular with far fewer people. And when she very publicly supported Hague, that damaged him rather.
And so what we end up with, of course, is another leadership contest in 2001. No surprise that William Haig resigns not long after the landslide. And this time again, we've got the two big beasts, Ken Clark and Michael Portillo, who are leading the field. Successes. Now, the interesting thing here is that the rules had changed. Conservative MPs, but also ordinary members of the party up and down the country, now both had a say. Um, and this didn't help Ken Clark because Conservative MPs were quite Eurosceptic, ordinary Conservative members probably even more so. So once again, Clark, despite his popularity with the public, found himself out in the wilderness because of his pro-European views. Equally, Michael Portillo's socially liberal views, his worry about the Conservatives being seen as intolerant, his far more positive attitude to issues around, for example, LGBT rights. Um, all of that was unpopular among a lot of ordinary traditional right-wing conservative members up in the country. And so it's neither Clark nor Portillo who wins, although Clark does get down to the final two. Uh, the surprise winner is Ian Duncan Smith. Now, Ian Duncan Smith had been a backbencher during the John Major years. He'd actually been a rebel on the the EU. He was very sceptic, but he now wins. Now, he had been in the shadow cabinet during the William Hages, but he's never had even a junior ministerial role in government. So Ian Duncan Smith is an outsider and very deliberately portrays himself as an outsider. Um, he's from the right of the party. That goes down well with a lot of MPs, but it goes down well also with uh, a lot of order. A little bit about Ian Duncan Smith, or IDS, as he tended to be called. Now, with IDS, it really is very quickly a story of failure. You'll see from the dates that he only lasts two years. Um, arguably, he has less charisma than William Hague. William Hague didn't go down brilliantly with the public, but was very good at Prime Minister's questions. IDS doesn't really manage to do either. And it's hard to be seen as charismatic when you're against Blair, because Blair oozed charisma. Even when he'd become less popular, he was still you know, very uh, effective as a politician. Um, IDS really wasn't. He was seen as dull. He was seen as a charisma-free zone. He was seen as a little bit odd as well. And literally months after he became leader, some of his own employees were beginning to plot. Now, IDS is interesting because he is very much from the right of the party. And yet he does believe in social justice. He talks a lot about social justice, about compassionate conservatism, about care for the most vulnerable. And it's not just uh, a kind of cynical attempt to win over voters. Uh, there is part of IDS that genuinely believes in this on principle. Uh, he says we are going to do more to tackle poverty. The problem for IDS is that he is so passionately hostile to the EU that within the party, uh, those divisions uh, really widen. The other thing that we get in IDS's time is the division between socially liberal modernisers, uh, the people who look to Mike Portillo, um, and also the social conservatives, the traditions. And these are on those old school moral issues, the kinds of things we talked about when we looked at Roy Jenkins in the 60s, issues around LGBT rights, for example. Um, one of the leading traditionalists is a new MP called David Cameron. We'll come back to him again. Um, and David Cameron and George Osborne, his close political ally, um, they're on the modernising wing. Now, IDS comes from the traditional conservative wing. And so when Labour and the Blair government plan to repeal Section 28, which had made it difficult for teachers to openly um, celebrate gay relationships, uh, Tony Blair said, well, we need to do this. This is a crazy throwback to the past. IDS is against that. Equally, when the Labour government want unmarried couples to be able to adopt children, um, IDS again says no. Now, 
David Cameron, George Osborne, some of the other modernising Conservative MPs rebel against that and vote with the Blair government. The problem for IDS, something that Jeremy Corbyn also found, like trying as Labour leader, is that when he was a backbencher, IDS was a rebel. When it came to the EU, he was constantly rebelling against the major government. So for him to be leader and go, no, you've got to do what I say, don't rebel, you know, behave yourself, uh, quite a lot of people will turn to him and go, well, well you didn't. You know, why, why should we? It's hard for him to enforce loyalty, to enforce party discipline. The irony is, as well, that where IDS does support the Blair government, it is on the issue which is their most unpopular. That was the decision to go along with the US in invading Iraq. And that war, as we know and as you'll have studied, uh, is massively and increasingly unpopular among the British public. Um, and so IDS had he Who's Blair on that? That could very much have gotten some bonus points with the public. Uh, the fact that he supports him, he is seen as having made a bad decision there. Um, it's the Lib Dems under Charles Kennedy uh, who can rightly say, look, of the big political parties in Britain, we are the only ones who have stood out against the war. So the decision to back uh, the Iraq war was definitely a political miscalculation. Um, and it goes from bad to worse. Uh, for IDS. By 2003, there's lots of controversy about the role of his wife, Betsy. Um, she's his secretary. Uh, there's a leak, there's a revelation about how much IDS pays her to be his secretary out of public money. And his MPs say, look, enough is enough. Vote of no confidence is held in his leadership, are enough. Unhappy MPs to trigger that. And IDS narrowly loses that and resigns as leader. So IDS doesn't even get the chance to fight a general election. Um, his successor, and there's no leadership contest because he's the only person who stands, is Michael Howard. Somebody else, like IDS, like Aig from the right of the party, but someone perhaps with the potential to unite it and to take on Blair in a way that neither IDS nor Haig little bit about Michael Howard. And as you can see, Howard takes over in 2003. He's also a fairly short-lived leader of the party. Now, the interesting thing about Michael Howard is he comes from the traditional wing. He was John Major's Home Secretary for several years. He was seen as very much on the right of the party. But when it comes to the coup and the replacement of IDS, Howard gets support from both traditionalists and modernisers. Uh, some of them, particularly the modernisers, don't like it necessarily. They don't necessarily agree with him and everything. But what Howard has is government experience. He's a very intelligent man. He's seen as serious. He's got not the charisma that Blair has, but a certain amount of gravitas. And he's seen as somebody who can present a challenge to Blair in a way that uh, Hagen, particularly IDS, didn't. However, he, he still can't. Not, not, not quite. And it's an interesting one because Blair is not the Blair of 97 or 2001. By 2003, uh, Blair has been weakened. He's less popular in his party and with the public by Iraq. And yet the Blair magic and charm and charisma hasn't gone entirely. And Howard, despite not being IDS, despite not being Hay, still can't quite match. In terms of policies, like we said, Howard is a right winger. Um, he talked less about social justice and compassionate conservatism than IDS did. Um, and there are still a lot of voters who look at Howard's party and go, you're still the nasty party. We still wouldn't trust you on the NHS and on schools. We trust Labour more than you. We might uh, hate what Blair did in Iraq, but we still feel that when it comes the domestic policy, New Labour, are more trustworthy. It's true, though, that Howard does manage to unite the party far more than IDS had done, and he just brings a bit of stability to a very divided and fractious party. And what's interesting is that Howard quite openly um, encourages leading modernisers. Um, late on in his leadership, he promotes David Cameron, to be Shadow Education Secretary, who promotes George Osborne to be Shadow Chancellor. Uh, yeah, they are really now like 
2005 seen as the two leading modernizers. And very interestingly, after he loses the 2005 election and paves away for a successor, Howard says, I believe my successor should be a modernizer. Howard may not agree with the modernizers then fully, but he sees which way the wind is blowing. Something you do need to be aware of, of course, is the fact that it is Howard who leads the Conservatives into the 2005 election, and it's Howard who, like Haig and Major before him, ends up losing to Of course, this is now the third defeat in a row. And for Conservatives, it's disappointing. Like we've said, Blair was far less popular than he had been four years and eight years previously. It was also the case that within the Labour Party, the supporters of Blair and Gordon Brown were, were really at, at war with each other. There were all sorts of rumours swirling around, many of which were pretty much true, about Blairites versus Brownites. Labour was a less popular party than it had been. Labour was increasingly a more divided party as well. But Howard couldn't quite. And like Haig before him, Howard had been part of the problem in that election campaign. So he had promoted Cameron, he had promoted Osborne, he had encouraged modernisers, but he was still the leader and his views were still too right wing for a country that was still in many ways up for that kind of socially liberal, economically centred new Labour government. And Howard had served in Thatcher's and Major's cabinets, he was seen by too many of the voters as a relic really of the past. And the Conservative manifesto very much reinforce the idea that Howard represented the fact right past, talked lots about thing, reducing the public sector, uh, it was very tough when it came to crime and punishment and to immigration, and there was quite a lot of very controversial and tough language about the traveller community as well. Um, and for a lot of voters, this was just the right wing. And when it came out that the deputy chairman of the party had been at a private dinner, and had been secretly recorded saying, when we get in, if we get in, we will be more fat right than ever, we'll do more privatisation. Um, and and that was not going to help the Conservative Party. You know, this deputy chairman said, oh, the modernisers won't tell the truth in public, but don't worry, we will be properly fat right. That doesn't go down well with the public. The public are still wanting economic centrism and so or at least most of them are. Having said all of that, this was a far better result than the previous two. It would be hard to be worse, but it was better. Uh, it was a majority of 64. 64 is comfortable. It's not in any way a landslide. Um, Howard was pleased that the Conservatives, maybe because of their very right wing manifesto, uh, had managed to see off the UKIP threat. UKIP was in the process of growing. It was obviously a very pro Brexit party. There was a real fear among the Conservatives that UKIP would lose them a lot of seats. I didn't really realise. But, and it is a big but, if you're David Cameron, if you're George Osborne, you will be saying after this that the Conservatives still needed to do more, more to appeal to voters who were in the political centre and socially liberal, far more needed um, to appeal to voters who were under 30, uh, voters in the North and female voters as well, all of whom seem to have still abandoned. And so the final thing that you need to know is that in the wake of the 2005 defeat and Michael Howard stepping down, that was not a surprise. Um, Howard had always been seen as a, a caretaker leader. What we end up with is another leadership. And it comes down to the two Davids. Uh, David Davis, quite an interesting character, a political maverick in some ways, uh, quite hard to pin down, but really representing the right of the party versus David Cameron the leader of the modernising faction. And Cameron was very open about it. And he says, well, you know, the public disciples, they think we're nasty. We need to detoxify our brand. We need to present a Conservative Party that's more inclusive. Now, Cameron knows this will win votes, but it is something that comes quite naturally to him. He believes a lot of this stuff. And he says, you know, we need to recognise that, rightly or wrongly, people think we don't like gay people. 
people. We don't like trans people. We're not like keen on young people or ethnic minorities. We're always having a go at single mothers. And Cameron says we've got to stop that. And we've certainly got to stop people thinking that that's what we are. And so Cameron says, look, I've got a new set of priorities. We are, if we get in, going to seriously work on tackling climate change. We are going to make sure we protect the NHS. We'll spend as much as Labour can spend on it. We'll do more for the LGBT community. Uh, we will increase our share of the budget that's given to overseas aid to help the poorest countries in the world. Um, and we'll talk less about the EU. We don't need people to think we're obsessed with it. Obviously, there's a massive irony in that, given that it's Cameron who calls the Brexit referendum, but that's something you don't need to know about here. Um, and the interesting thing is, finally, finally, Tony Blair and certainly Gordon Brown begin to struggle. Labour, although it won in 2005, is not the force it was, particularly after the Iraq war. And because Cameron is, for a lot of people, relatively charming, relatively charismatic, he's young, he's younger than Blair, um, he is an effective speaker, he's talking in a centrist way. Labour struggles to really have a go at Cameron. They can't anymore just say, well, he represents the nasty party. So there are some people in the Conservative Party who think this is long overdue. They celebrate what Cameron is saying. They recognise it will help the Conservatives to win the next election. However, there are some on the right, particularly some of Thatcher's old cabinet, and most famously Norman Tebbit, who had been party chairman under Thatcher, who are very critical of Cameron. They say, you rejected Thatcherism, you have undone the legacy that she left, all this social liberalism is not proper conservatism, this is just a lighter version of Blairism. So Cameron is a controversial figure win in some quarters within his party. Having said that, because Labour is becoming more unpopular, um, and when Gordon Brown takes over as PM in 2007, he doesn't cut through to the voters in the way that Blair does. Um, ultimately, Conservatives start to sniff victory, even by 2007. And because of that, other than hardcore fact rights, most of the party are more than prepared to give Cameron a go. And we can certainly argue that the party is probably more united around its leader than it had been at any time, probably since the John Major honeymoon in 1990 and since his election victory in 1992. And although it's outside our period, that enthusiasm about Cameron paid off to an extent when, of course, he becomes prime minister in 2010. Huge thank you to Tom there for another excellent video looking at the Conservative Party 97 to 2007. So this is part of our series looking at, at modern Britain 1951 to 2007, which is aimed at helping uh, A-level students, particularly studying the AQA Unit 2S. So check out the channel for more videos like this and on other uh, history units and history uh, and history topics, as well as loads of stuff on politics in particular, helping you with A-level politics. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so. Uh, leave some uh, likes to uh, show your appreciation for Tom and then ask any comments or leave any questions or leave any comments below. Uh, and also you can find some of our shorter videos now on TikTok as well. Thank you very much for watching. And again, a huge thank you to Tom.